This meeting is being recorded. Hello everyone, this is Anthony Alaka with Torrey Hills Capital and welcome to the Medicine and Therapeutics webcast for February 16th, 2022. Hope everyone's doing well and thanks for taking the time today to join our virtual lunch. We are very excited to bring you Medicine and Therapeutics. Medicine and Therapeutics is a clinical stage immunotherapy company that uses engineered interleukins that can amplify, blunt, or fine tune the immune system in order to treat various cancers. Medicine is MDNA 55 is being developed to treat recurrent glioblastoma, which is a, an aggressive brain cancer. MDNA 55 has already shown promising trial results. Another treatment in the company's pipeline is MDNA 11, an interleukin 2 that has already shown safety and efficacy in the stimulation of anti-cancer immune cells in preliminary clinical data. Medicine and Therapeutics trades on the NASDAQ under the ticker MDNA. The company shares are currently trading with a market cap of only $100 million US. So when you consider the size of the addressable market and the recent M&A activity in the space, we feel there's plenty of upside in the stock. With us today to discuss Medicina Therapeutics and the company's strategy going forward is the company's president and CEO, Fahar Merchant, and the company's CFO, Elizabeth Williams. We also have Dr. Mark Swaim, our resident expert at Torrey Hills and all things biotech. So I want to welcome everyone to the call. It's great to have you on today. Thanks. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of exciting things happening with the company. I'm happy to have you share those with the group. Uh, before we get started, I just want to mention if our viewers have any questions, uh, I think everybody's familiar with the format. Uh, simply type your question into, Q into the Q&A or chat box, and we'll make sure your questions get answered. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Swain for some opening comments, then Fahar and Elizabeth will take us through the presentation, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So with that said, Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, really appreciate it. It's a pleasure, the first order, to be back on the air with Medicina and uh, our old friends, Dr. Merchant and uh, Elizabeth Williams. These are people of the first magnitude, first order in biotech. And, and in our opinion, we follow them for a long time at our sister to Torrey Hills uh, Biopub, my website. Uh, in 2020, uh, 2020, Fahar was our uh, CEO of the year, and uh, Liz Williams was our woman of the year in biotech. Uh, uh, these are just insuperable people and uh, really thrilled to be here talking with them again today. Uh, we think there just is no better, in my opinion, investment pick in, in biotech, the space, than this company. It's flying under radar. It's woefully undervalued. It's, it's a great investment, in my opinion. It's one of my largest personal investments and I'm proud to be a shareholder, have been for several years. Dr. Merchant is a PhD biochemist and Someone I view as the sort of the king of the structure function relationships in proteins. Every domain, every whirl, every twist, every helix in a, in a protein molecule does something, confers some kind of activity. And much of his work in terms of drugs that have, have come to bear from the company uh, pertain to molecules that don't really occur in nature that are improvements upon nature. Some of you may say, well, well you're on shaky ground there. You're saying they deal in Franken proteins. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that uh, nature doesn't always have it right. You know, Spinoza, the philosopher, said famously that we know that nature never <clears throat> works with the end in view. And those of you who think nature has it right, I'd like to point out that uh, the thing that we're almost likely to die of, cardiac disease, is largely because our hearts have but three coronary arteries. If we had a way of <laughs> rejiggering the heart to maybe have 10 of those so that occlusion wasn't such a serious problem, we'd probably live longer. So nature hasn't always got it right. And there are ways of taking apart molecules, dressing them down, figure out, figuring out what domain does what and improving upon that. And that's really what the company is about. I think you'll speak a little bit to MDNA 55, which is a molecule that is totally contrived. It doesn't occur in nature at all, but has remarkable one, two potency at uh, dealing with glioblastoma multiform, and as a result, a single dose can extend the survival in those patients by an amazing 150%, completely unprecedented. Ditto for their bespoke IL-2 variant. They're taking interleukin-2 and really improving upon that radically over what the natural molecule is. A brief anecdote, and I don't want to babble over Dr. Uh, Merchant's uh, space here, but uh, about 20 years ago, I remember being at MD Anderson. I was a professor there for a while. And the first weekend on call, gastroenterology, I'm called to see a guy <clears throat> who is in the ICU. He has received proleukin, a, 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 a therapy for cancer. He had metastatic renal cell carcinoma, advanced disease, 
was on a treatment protocol. Interleukin-2 was marketed as proleukin and was tried for a time as an anti-cancer therapy. I think of it like um, the Herbert von Karajan or something like that, a master orchestrator of the immune system, a molecule that's built ability to go in and take charge and say, go, go take care of that tumor. Remember, you don't get cancer unless there's a kind of failure of the immune system to, to conquer and, and act. And the patient was having mild rectal bleeding and he looked like somebody that I was not going to endoscope. And the reason being is he, he really looked like death was approaching. He was just morbid, ashen, largely unresponsive. And you know, I asked one of my team members, give me a current set of vital signs. And they were stabler than I would have guessed they would be. And so, you know, I kind of hemmed and hawed and said, really, I, I don't know that we're going to find something that would make all this better by endoscopy. And I said, he may seem sedate or obtunded now, but the minute, uh, you know, an endoscope is introduced into his south side, he'll wake up. And, uh, it won't be pleasant. I don't want to be the guy giving him sedatives when he looks like this. And so we negotiated, we got anesthesia to come and in a very controlled hyper monitored way, titrate his sedation. We scoped him ischemic colitis and we're able to help him a bit with that. That guy amazingly <clears throat> as close to death as he looked like went on to survive and, and conquer his tumor, eradicate it all away, which was a stunner. And yet, really, the world, by and large, did not want to continue using recombinant interleukin-2, the native molecule, because of these whopping, potent, negative side effects. And so along come several varieties of improved upon interleukin-2s, of which we think the best of breed is metacenas. And what they're trying to do is, by modifying the domains of the protein, come up with something that, uh, all the pleasures, none of the pain, if you will, something that you can invoke, summon, put into motion the immune system to a more potent degree, but not wield all the toxicity. And I, the preliminary evidence suggests that that's exactly what they've come up with. We're going to hear all about that today. It's a fascinating narrative. Welcome to Dr. Merchant. Good to have you and to Liz as well. Great to be in the company of both of you. It's wonderful. Great. Uh, thanks, Mark. Always a pleasure to uh, have an opportunity to have this uh, really intellectual uh, conversation with you. So really happy that uh, this time around, we've, uh, we've sort of made progress on our IL-2 program and love to share more information on, on the IL-2 program. But of course, we'll talk about MDNF55 as well, the glioblastoma program later on. But let me sort of continue with the, um, the conversation that you commenced with. And, and this is where we are with Medicena, uh, where the focus is really, as you said, nature has come up with its own, uh, you know, therapies or molecules, and and what we're doing here is uh, making improvements to nature using what we call evolutionary design or directed evolution, in a sense, uh, created molecules that have the slight modifications uh, in such a way that we are able to generate what we call these superkinds, and these superkinds are. Really, the focus of the company is on three different interleukins, namely IL-2, IL-4, and IL-13. And, and these three different uh, interleukins are where we are focused on. And I think if you look at this particular three interleukins, we know that these molecules have all sorts of effects on modulating as many as 2,000 different types of diseases. So the opportunities are quite substantial with this uh, platform that we've got. And uh, what we'll do today is provide you an update on MDNA 11. Key uh, message to take home is really that we'll have uh, multiple news flow uh, uh, events coming up over the year. And, and uh, obviously the most uh, relevant that's uh, soon to be on the horizon is the middle of this year when we'll share data from our CT scans, MRI, MRI scans from patients that are currently uh, enrolling in the dose escalation part of the clinical trial with MDNA 11. I'll talk more about MDNA 11 shortly. Uh, and then of course, MDNA 55 as well, where as you mentioned, the uh, improvement in survival outcome has been quite dramatic, uh, over 100% survival. Uh, and in some cases, over 150% improvement in survival in median uh, OS, which is quite dramatic following just one treatment. And then what we've done is taken the program further along to create this bifunctional 
four kinds. We call them biscuits. And these biscuits are uh, really your next generation where we leverage our cytokines, our superkines in such a manner that we are able to uh, hopefully treat patients uh, that currently don't respond to checkpoint inhibitors or immunotherapies, mainly because these, these tumors are cold. Uh, they don't respond to immunotherapies uh, because they essentially are hidden from the immune system, how we can sort of, uh, sort of uh, expose those tumors so that the immune system can then uh, attack those tumors. So let's do that and let's go to the next slide. Uh, just to start, start you off, obviously we have a, a really experienced management team. As you can see, uh, we have uh, individuals that have experience not only in smaller biotechs, mid-sized biotechs, but also big pharma. So we cover a full range of that expertise within Medicina and, and continue to grow our expertise with respect to bringing in uh, world-class scientific and clinical advisors uh, that, that we've recently announced on our scientific advisory board. So uh, using the leverage and expertise of individuals who have uh, prior experience, uh, the focus is how do we uh, explore the IL-2 program and, and get as much as, um, uh, you know, value built around that particular asset as we possibly can. And just as a background to your listeners, what I want to make sure is that they're sort of aware as to what's happened in the IL-2 space uh, in the past three years. So the first one that was in 2018 uh, was a rather, rather large transaction, uh, $3.6 billion dollar uh, deal between Bristol Myers and Nectar uh, regarding their IL-2, and I'll talk about you know challenges with Nectar's molecule and and why we we feel that we have a much better compound there. Uh, similarly, I will also bring into context another program uh, built by a company called Synthorex, now owned by Sanofi, following a two and a half billion dollar purchase uh, while they were in a phase one clinical trial. Uh, so that happened a year later in 2019. And then earlier last year, we had uh, another transaction in the IL-2 space, although not in the oncology space, in the autoimmune disease space, uh, was the acquisition by Merck of, of Pandion for just under $2 billion, again, in a phase one setting as well. Uh, Medicina also has a IL-2, uh, which is a super antagonist. We call that molecule MDNA-209. Again, that particular molecule, we feel has uh, exciting opportunities in the autoimmune space as well. Uh, we won't talk much about that today, but hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that in, in the future. We'll focus on cancer today, but clearly there is that other opportunity as well. And then finally, uh, we've seen um, an IPO that took place uh, late last year with Zilio, uh, again in a phase one clinical trial, as you can see market cap around 0.4 billion. So um, where we are right now with Medicina, of course, our market cap is, as you know, just uh, under 100 million. And we feel that the opportunity for uh, our potentially best-in-class IL-2 uh, is, is likely to provide data that's uh, going to be really exciting in the coming months. So um, Mark, you talked about Prolukin. You mentioned the fact that it uh, has the potential of uh, really uh, causing tumor regressions and in some cases, long-term cures in patients with melanoma or renal cell carcinoma, the example you gave, for instance. But you're right, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a very potent drug. It's uh, at the same time, incredibly toxic. And that toxicity is mainly due to uh, one problem. And that is the, the fact that the molecule binds to this particular receptor known as the alpha receptor or CD25. And this alpha receptor, as you can see on the slide on the left-hand side, Prolukin, which is uh, in the marketplace, been approved 20 years ago, tends to bind to this alpha receptor. And as a result of that binding to alpha receptor causes the life-threatening side effects that, that Mark just mentioned. What we've done is uh, with MDNA-109, uh, which is the you know, backbone of our platform, is that we have engineered it uh, in such a manner that it will now preferentially bind to a different receptor known as the beta receptor. This receptor, the beta receptor, is a receptor that's expressed uh, specifically on cancer-fighting immune cells, but not uh, on, on the regulatory T cells that actually protect the tumor, 
uh, and therefore we feel that our approach uh, is very distinct from everybody else. I talked to you about Synthorex, I talked to you about Nectar, et cetera. And you'll see as we share data with you today, uh, we'll show you how different we are and why we think our approach is so much better, okay? So uh, Mark pointed out earlier with respect to the challenges with proleukin, uh, and in addition to the fact that it's a toxic molecule, the other problem with the proleukin is that because of its uh, size, it clears to the kidneys very quickly, and patients therefore have to be administered the drug uh, every eight hours, and that process goes on for five days continuously, assuming they can tolerate the treatment. Um, and uh, what happens with proleukin is that when a patient is going to be treated uh, with proleukin, uh, these patients are not admitted to hospital. They actually are taken straight into an intensive care unit. This is where they are admitted because uh, they know, the physicians know that this patient will suffer some life-threatening side effects and they will need to have best potential care to make sure that they, they don't uh, pass away during treatment. So what's happened is two things. There have been attempts to create uh, molecules that stay in the bloodstream much longer. And one of those approaches is using a technique known as pegylation, where you take a piece of plastic and you chemically conjugate it to your molecule, in this case being proleukin. And this way, the molecule is much larger, stays in the bloodstream much longer, and therefore, you, have, uh, you don't have the need for treating patients uh, three times a day. Instead, you might treat patients now once every two weeks or once every three weeks. The second thing with this alpha approach is that you are somehow able to minimize binding to your alpha receptor, which causes the toxicity, which is great. But at the same time, what happens is that this approach is for attaching pegylation is that it also reduces binding to beta, and that really dramatically reduces the uh, efficacy of the drug. And then finally, pegylation is not a simple manufacturing process. It does, it is complex, it has really poor yields, the cost of goods are substantial, and the worst thing is that every batch you make, you cannot guarantee that one batch is consistent from a second batch that is made a month later or a week later and so on. So there's a lot of product variability, which is a challenge. And this is what we've done at Medicina. We've taken our approach to create a molecule that is uh, to totally independent of pegylation, but at the same time provides the safety as well as uh, extension of the half-life of the molecule. Okay. So Hari, as, a, as an investor, I personally would just never invest in a in a biotech promulgating a biomolecule that's pegylated. pegylated. Know a lot about it. There's so many downsides to it. I just won't go that's there. True. Exactly right, and and that's what we've done with with MDNA eleven. What we've done instead is instead of using pegylation, we've used albumin. And albumin, as you know, is the most abundant protein in our bloodstream. And uh, therefore, we are able to increase the size of the molecule quite dramatically and have the same benefit of extending half-life as you would get with, say, pegylation. The other thing that's really important about uh, albumin is that we always consistently get the same molecule batch to batch. So there's no variation. We've, basically, what we've done is inserted the gene sequence for albumin and the gene sequence for our drug, link them together, and we are always manufacturing the same molecule every time. So that's really important. The third thing that's really crucial and that sort of uh, differentiates us from everybody else is the fact that albumin tends to accumulate in the tumor itself. And this way uh, you have localization of our drug right at the tumor site plus the fact that albumin will also accumulate in the lymphatic system, in the tumor draining lymph nodes. This is where all the immune cells are present and that's where you want to have our drug be present. And this is something that nobody else does. We are the only ones that use albumin to, to uh, achieve that. So in the end, we wanted to see, okay, what does uh, MDNA 11 look like in terms of its selectivity? And you can see on the left-hand side, if you look on the top left, you see that proleukin, which is the backbone of the drug uh, 
um, manufactured by Alkermis, Synthorex, New Lookin, uh, as well as uh, uh, Nectar, et cetera. You can see that it binds very tightly to the alpha receptor, whereas on the top right, you can see that MDNA11 does not bind to the alpha receptor, which is responsible for the toxicity. Now, with respect to the beta receptor, if you look at this bottom left, you can see that the uh, uh, IL-2 does not bind efficiently to the beta receptor. And that's the receptor that is responsible for stimulating the cancer-fighting immune cells. And it's not doing a good job there. Whereas MDNA11, as you can see on the bottom right, it binds really efficiently to the beta receptor and therefore uh, is uh, able to do a much better job in stimulating your cancer-fighting immune cells. Now, if you look at our competitors, uh, here you have Sanofi's drug on the left-hand side. Yes, it does a good job. If you look at the bottom panel on the left, you can see that it does not bind to the alpha receptor. But if you look at the panel above that, you can see that uh, the Thor 707, now it's known as SAR245, that particular molecule does not bind efficiently to the receptor beta. As you can see, it's actually doing worse than IL-2. And, and then on the right-hand side, you see the same thing with the uh, Nectar's drug, Bempeg. Uh, that molecule has six polyethylene glycol molecules. And during the time when it has those six Peg, peg molecules attached to it, the molecule is doing nothing. It's essentially inactive. It's only when it has lost its four pegs that you can see that it starts binding to beta and it also binds to alpha at the same time. So what you're seeing is you're not getting the selectivity in terms of uh, reduced binding to alpha, it binds to alpha, but it's binding to alpha and beta, especially beta, if you look at it, uh, its binding to beta is quite poor. It's uh, substantially worse than that of IL-2. So not surprisingly, if you look at data, the clinical data that have come out for Thor-707, as well as BAMPEG, both of them show that in a monotherapy setting, none of them have been able to demonstrate tumor control or tumor response uh, the way Prolukin has been able to do. So this is where there is the uh, big challenge and how we have been able to uh, generate a molecule that's not dependent on pegylation, that has an engineered component in it where its binding to the beta receptor is at least 30-fold higher than that of IL-2, okay? So if you go to the next slide, what we are clearly able to show here is a model here. This is a cancer tumor or a colon cancer tumor model. And on the top, you can see that uh, we've treated these mice with uh, MDNA11, just MDNA11 on its own. And what is interesting is that with the treatment on the top left, uh, these, these mice received the dose of just two mix per keg. Uh, and this was administered just twice. And seven out of 10 mice there were tumor free. When we increased the dose to five mix per keg, uh, all 10 mice out of 10 were tumor free. What we then did was those mice that were tumor free, we injected more tumors in them. So you can see uh, the black plot is showing you the untreated mice and you can see the tumors growing very rapidly there. Whereas the blue plot, which is sitting right at, at the X axis, those mice that were cured received uh, more tumor, but you can see that these mice never ever accepted the tumor. They've simply rejected the tumor in a way that you would normally see in a situation where if there was a tumor recurrence or metastasis to occur, what we are able to see is that despite the fact that these mice did not receive any additional drug, these mice had a memory immune system where the immune system had already recognized that the tumors come back let's attack the tumor and that's what you see happening here. So what we are almost seeing here is very much like a vaccine-like effect with just a two rounds of treatment with our drug where any subsequent future treatments would push out or reject the tumor uh, and therefore uh, able to provide long-term cures potentially in, in, uh, in not only mice, but hopefully in, in humans as well. Far, what kind of tumor cell was being injected, what sort of cancer? Uh, this was MC38, this was a colon cancer. Uh, 
Okay. So this Thank is like colon cancer. And, you know, what we had done is, you know, we don't have data here, but what we had done was we treated these mice with NTPD1, uh, a checkpoint inhibitor, very much like a mouse version of Keytruda or Obdivo out there in the marketplace. And we found that those mice that were receiving treated, treatment with just that particular molecule, uh, there was no tumor control at all. Whereas uh, it was only when you combined it with MDNA 11, were you able to see tumor shrinkage. So clearly the checkpoint inhibitor was not as, as potent as effective on its own, but when you brought in our MDNA 11, uh, it was a different story altogether, okay? So now when we look at uh, non-human primates, we obviously went to, to uh, you know, uh, a species that resembles humans as much as we, uh, with respect to the immune system. And uh, here uh, we are administering the drug once every two weeks. And we wanted to see if you are stimulating our cancer-fighting immune cells. So on the left-hand side, you see that as we uh, treat these uh, monkeys with our drug, we see a, a huge increase in a population known as KI67 positive uh, immune cells, meaning that these cells are uh, rapidly dividing, proliferating, and so on and so forth. And you can see that we are able to uh, increase the expression of KI67 way above 50%. Uh, and that stays that way for almost two weeks before it comes back down to baseline uh, after two weeks. On the right-hand side, you see a different drug, Tor-707 that I talked to you about, which is now Sanofi's drug. As you have seen, that particular drug has not been able to show uh, tumor shrinkage in, in, uh, in the clinical trial yet. But again, you can see that in this model, uh, they have to inject the drug once every week uh, to boost the population of immune fighting T cells. But that too, you can see that the, the increase in the population of uh, CDA T cells or proliferation uh, lasts a really a very brief moment. It just peaks and then very quickly comes back down to baseline and uh, indicating that from a pharmacodynamic perspective, this pegylated molecule that you see with Tor sound of sound is not as effective. So going to the next slide, uh, what we've done here now is uh, commence the phase one, two clinical trial in humans. This is uh, where we are with uh, dose escalation. But this clinical trial has three portions to it. The first one is the dose escalation portion, which is where we are right now. Once we have completed that and established what we call the recommended phase two dose, and the plan is that we should be getting there uh, by the middle of this year, uh, we will then commence in the third quarter of this year a single agent dose expansion. And then also uh, parallel to that is a dose expansion, but this time in combination with the checkpoint inhibitor. So those data should be coming out during the second half of this year, uh, but the data that we'll share in the middle of this year will be from the dose escalation portion, which is on the left-hand side. We've already treated patients in dose level one, we finished dose level two, these are the low doses of the drug. We are now enrolling patients in the middle uh, phase of the trial where we are now dosing patients in dose level three. And we expect to continue that into dose level four. And so far we have not seen signs of uh, dose limiting toxicities. Uh, you obviously, uh, Mark, you brought out a number of uh, life-threatening potential uh, side effects that these patients may suffer, but we have not seen that. The good thing here is we are administering the drug uh, once every two weeks. And uh, hopefully as we increase the dose, uh, we may be able to administer the drug once every three weeks. So we'll see how, how that goes. And uh, I'll share with you some data in the next uh, couple of slides here. So just to give you an example uh, on CD8 T cells, these are cancer fighting immune cells and also NK cells, which is also uh, works in, in coordination with CD8 T cells to fight cancer. And you can see that at the doses we are using right now, which is uh, uh, less than 10 micrograms per kilogram, but really in, in, the, in, in the sense of uh, how much drug is being administered, how much IL-2 is being administered, it's less than two micrograms per kilogram. You can see that we are nearly doubling the population of uh, CD8 T cells, same with the NK cells. And then on the right-hand side, what you can clearly see is that we are not stimulating Tregs. 
these are the ones that are responsible for uh, hiding the tumor or protecting the tumor. So we are maintaining this uh, twofold uh, advantage of the cancer fighting immune cells compared to T-Rex. Now, the other thing that is really important to note is the dosing that we're using here is that it's down to less than two micrograms per kilogram. When we compare with our competitors, uh, here we have uh, SAR-245 or Thor-707. This is Sanofi's drug that they reported data. And you can see that they're using doses of eight and 16 micrograms per kilogram based on I2 content, which is eight times higher than what we are using. And then too, they're seeing improvement in CDAT cell population at about the same range as where we are, uh, considering that we are at eight times lower dose. So we look forward to the next steps as we increase the dose and, and see how we do. And if you look at uh, BAMPAC, uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, if you look at BAMPAC, they have data. They don't actually tell you what the, the dose is, but they say it's 3, 6, 9, and 12 micrograms per kilogram. But that's based on IL-2 content, okay? Uh, I case, clarify that uh, BEMPEG is nectar's molecule. Right, that's true. Good point, Liz. So BEMPEG is nectar's molecule. They've got data on 10 patients here on this particular slide on the left-hand side. Of those 10 patients, only three of them or four of them show an increase uh, in CD8 T cell population. But that too at substantially higher doses than, than MDNA-11. Now, if you look on the right-hand side, you can see that BAMPEG does a great job of stimulating T-Rex. You can see that it increases the population of T-Rex by eight to 10, or in some cases, even 20 fold. And that is a problem. T-Rex are going to protect the tumor. You do not want to stimulate your T-Rex. If you look at the, the slide on the extreme right, you can see that MDNA 11 doesn't do a great job in stimulating T-Rex. This is exactly what we want whereas BAMPEG does a great job in stimulating T-Rex. And not surprisingly, you've not been able to see uh, patients uh, have the tumor shrink with uh, Nectar's drug. So with that in mind, you know, I would say that we've clearly identified ourselves as uh, potentially best in class. And here we're sort of uh, covering a number of other uh, competitors out there, our Kermis, Neolukin, et cetera, but across the entire different key parameters that we're looking at, particularly the selectivity of binding to alpha, uh, or rather not binding to alpha, but binding to beta, and also the fact that we have potentially a much better safety profile down the road. And uh, the other thing that is very important is that once you attach a polyethylene glycol, a PEG, that makes it very difficult as to what you can do with the technology. With genetic mutation, we can take our gene sequence and uh, you know, create what we call biscuits, or we can fuse it to an antibody so that we're able to target the tumor, or we can fuse it to a checkpoint inhibitor, as you can see on the right-hand side. What the, 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 the tree or, or what you see on the right-hand side is what you can create is a host of a uh, number of different treatment approaches uh, with MDNA 11 and our MDNA 109 platform, which is something you cannot do with all the other technologies out there. So to basically wrap up here with the IL-2 program, uh, key data points, uh, we've uh, provided some data uh, late last year. We'll have more efficacy data coming up middle of this year, particularly the CT scans uh, from the dose escalation part. Uh, and then of course, in the second half of this year, we'll have dose expansion data on the monotherapy setting and combination setting as well. And, and that's, I think, uh, where we are and uh, looking forward to sharing more data on our next generation platform as well, which is the Biscuits platform. We are hoping to present the data on Biscuits uh, at one of the conferences this spring. Uh, so we'll keep you guys updated on that as well. So now going to MDNA 55, this is the other program that Mark uh, talked about this is a drug which is targeting the interleukin-4 receptor, but also targeting the tumor microenvironment at the same time. And you can see here is an example of one patient here uh, receiving a drug. Uh, at the top, you can see that the patient's tumor at baseline before the patient received the drug. The drug was administered just one time, one treatment in these patients. And you can see that 
Uh, at day 60, the tumor is much smaller. At day 90, it's even smaller. And by day 120, it's pretty much uh, not there at that point. And this is, in, you know, you can see at the second set of uh, uh, slide at the bottom is the colors. So the blue color is the tumor. This is um, the, the sort of the area that circled at the top. Uh, and you can see that as you go from left to right, the, the blue portion of the tumor uh, sort of basically uh, disappears. So you can see that it gets smaller and smaller over a period of time. And there's more of the red portion, meaning that there is more of the dead cells or dead tissue there. So this is really encouraging. And we saw this translate into much better survival outcomes for these patients. So when we look at this survival of uh, patients treated just once with MNF55, we see that the median survival was 15.7 months. Now, if you look at other therapies that are approved out there uh, that are used for patients with recurrent glioblastoma, median survival is within six and nine months. But we did not want to just take those data as gospel. And what we did was we instead decided to conduct a separate clinical trial where we enrolled patients that had received other therapies and we matched the patients with the patients that were enrolled in the MDN55 clinical trial. As you can see on the right hand side, those patients. Uh, that received other therapies, the median survival was just 7.2 months versus 15.7 months with, with MDNA 55. So we're seeing more than doubling survival outcome of these patients. And then especially when you look at a subgroup of patients that got low dose Avastin or Bevacizumab to control or minimize use of steroids, we found that the median survival there was actually 18 and even 21 months. So uh, really, the, the opportunity is quite considerable with this particular approach to treat patients. Uh, and we had a meeting with the FDA, and clearly uh, with this uh, drug and the data that we had, we were able to have the FDA buy in to a new approach of conducting the phase three registration trial, where we would, instead of enrolling uh, an equal number of patients, to be treated with the standard of care, the FDA agreed that two thirds of the patients in the control arm would be from an external control arm, meaning that these patients uh, would, uh, you know, could be enrolled simply by us or Medicina collecting data from hospital registries so that we don't actually have to enroll patients. So this certainly helps in reducing the the cost of the clinical trial speeds up the clinical trial and provides us with really good, reliable data and encourages patients to enroll in the clinical trial because there's a higher probability that they'll receive MDNA55 instead of standard of care. So, so this is where we are with uh, MDNA55. Medicina is looking to partner this program. We were hoping to have this partnered last year, uh, but of course the key thing was uh, that uh, uh, the, the unknown part of MDNA55 was that uh, pharma companies uh, were not sure if, uh, if uh, CED, the, the local administration of the drug, would be something that uh, hospitals or neurosurgeons would be comfortable with in terms of uh, administering this. So they wanted to have some robust data there to show that neurosurgeons would be comfortable with our drug delivery technique. And therefore we went ahead and conducted a really extensive primary market research where we interviewed about 40 neurosurgeons, 20 in Europe, 20 in the US, and wanted to get their feedback. Would they use MDNA55 in patients with recurrent glioblastoma? And the overwhelming feedback was yes, they would. In fact, they also said, that they would also look at using MDNA55 in newly diagnosed patients because they felt that it would be better to treat patients earlier on uh, rather than waiting for patients uh, at the end stage of the disease. So that was- Mark, really can you tell what happened in Japan with the oncolytic virus approval? Yes, I'll, I'll certainly add that to the, the story here, of course. And, and the second thing was, of course, they were concerned that, uh, you know, they would be the first company in the world to deliver a drug uh, in the brain, they did not want to be, you know, the guinea pigs in that space. And uh, fortunately, towards the end of last year, 
uh, a company in Japan, Daiichi Sankyo, uh, got approval for an oncolytic virus to treat patients with glioblastoma. And, and those, uh, that particular drug uh, was approved. It's only approved in Japan right now. It was approved based on a single center clinical trial. And uh, this drug uh, needs to be administered into the brain six times. So basically uh, patients have to undergo a surgical procedure every month for six months to get that oncolytic virus. So clearly that was another big hurdle that I think now we're in a much better position uh, to now talk to pharma companies and say, hey, look, MD-55 needs a single administration, not six treatments the way Daiichi Sankyo. And by the way, you will not be the first company with a drug which is being delivered in the brain. Daiichi, which is a significant entity out there is already treating patients. Um, in Japan, which is, as you know, a very conservative uh, regulatory pathway there for them to approve a drug uh, with six administrations or six injections in the brain, and then a 55 only needs one treatment. So that was another big thing. And then finally, the, the, the other bit of information that was missing was would um, uh, insurance uh, companies cover it? Would it be uh, reimbursed? Uh, and, and what with the pricing of uh, a drug like MDNA55. So again, we had to do a market research on that front, which we had not done before. So that again came out quite positive in terms of what the pricing might be. And, um, and also that the, the payers uh, were encouraged with the data. They said, yes, they would reimburse. So, so again, this was done not only in the US, but also in Europe and getting that kind of feedback was really solid information. So with that sort of background, we are now able to sort of progress into the next steps of uh, partnering and hopefully we'll get something done this year. Now I'll sort of pass it on to Liz so she can talk more about the cash position and, and then plans for the future with respect to our milestones, et cetera. Liz. Sounds good. Um, so we, as was mentioned at the beginning, we are listed on NASDAQ, also on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker MDNA. Our headquarters are in, in Toronto, Canada, and we also have a location in Houston, Texas as well. We just reported our December 31st results um, last week. And at that time we had 23.4 million Canadian in the bank. Uh, that takes us through to the end of this calendar year, very early next year. So we are funded through the initial efficacy data update as Fahar uh, talked earlier from the MDNA 11 trial. That runway doesn't include any additional proceeds um, from potential partnering transaction or anything like that. It's just based on cash on hand. Um, we have very clean capital structure, no debt, no preferred shares, just uh, common shares of which there's 55 million, just a little over 55 million issued and outstanding. And on a fully diluted basis, we're just under 64 million. The difference there being stock options as well as uh, some warrants. And I think that is the last slide. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Fahar and Elizabeth and Mark. Um, great presentation. That, that data is so impressive, not only- so for Gold MDNA. medal data, Anthony. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for Not only for MDNA 11, but for MDNA 55 as well. Um, I'm going to open the floor up to questions from our attendees. Um, obviously, the easiest way to ask is to type into the Q&A box. So we'll wait a few moments uh, as the questions trickle in. Um, uh, for the feedback purposes, today's code word is Marlin, M-A-R-L-I-N. Um, quick question on, um, you talked about um, the pricing, you know, finding out the pricing um, uh, compared to, um, pricing as well as the insurance reimbursement. Can you talk about how the pricing right now compares to the current standard of care? Do you have an idea of that? Right, so, uh, you know, if you look at the current uh, treatments out there, uh, they've now lost patent protection. They are generic drugs, timozolomide being one of them. The other being uh, used to be a Vastin uh, that again has lost its patent protection. Uh, so from, from that perspective, uh, those kinds of care basically are uh, in the thirty to forty thousand dollars range per year. So that's uh, what the pricing is with respect to 
those therapies. However, when we had the conversations with, uh, with different uh, payers, et cetera, uh, they felt that the, the improvement in survival that you're seeing with MDNA55 and being that it's a novel therapy and the fact that these patients would have uh, fewer um, other treatments to manage toxicities with chemotherapy, et cetera, and the quality of life would be much better. They looked at all those parameters and they felt that uh, MDNA 55 could potentially be priced uh, at about double what, what was contemplated or what currently is the case with Avastin and, uh, and Timozolamide. So, so we sort of feel that it's more in the sort of uh, closer to the $80,000 range rather than 30 to 40,000 range. So that was quite encouraging. Great, thank you. Sorry, calls for speculation, I admit, but do you think eventually, and I, I, this is your guess, but you know, when when there, there are subsequent MDNA55 trials and we see the effect of multiple serial doses of MDNA55, what do you think those will look like? And where do you think the consensus may weigh in on how many serial doses are ideal for bringing mm -hmm. about survival? Yeah, so, you know, we've, we've not had too much experience with respect to multiple dosing with the drug, but I would expect that uh, the moment uh, the tumor was to see or a patient was had signs of tumor relapse, or if a patient had a partial response, for instance, uh, that patient could very quickly within, you know, six months after the first treatment, get a second treatment. Uh, with MDNA55 as well, so that a partial response could convert into a complete response, or a stable disease could convert into a, a partial or a complete response with a second treatment, or in the case of a patient that had a par a previously a partial or a complete response, let's say a year or two later, could benefit from a second treatment if the tumor ever comes back. So, so that's, you know, uh, from a frequency of administration, I would say that it's likely that it's not every month the way it is with uh, the HE's drug, but we're probably looking at, uh, you know, a couple of times a year at the most. Mm -hmm. So, so that would be uh, probably the most frequent dosing regimen, uh, provided, of course, the tumor came back. Okay. Great. I, you and I obviously know the answer to this. The next question, but I want to ask it publicly just to sort of air it because I've had several readers over the course of time write in and say, I didn't, I didn't really want to ask this question, you know, maybe it's a dumb question, but could you, somebody explain to me why MDNA 55 can't be given IV? Right. Now, the, the reason is this, that uh, MDNA 55 uh, has two parts to it. There's an IL-4 domain, which is really the, the targeting domain that sort of uh, delivers a payload, and the payload is a toxin. And this particular payload is a toxin, it's derived from bacteria. And because it's not a human toxin, what would happen is if you were to administer it IV, you would start generating antibodies against the uh, toxin portion. So that when the patient received a second or third dose, uh, what would happen is that the drug would be neutralized and therefore uh, you would not benefit much from the drug. You will only benefit um, you know, if you are able to deliver the drug locally, directly in the tumor, so this uh, works really well in the brain uh, because very little of the drug leaks out outside the, the brain. There's no systemic toxicities and therefore the chance of anti-drug antibodies or neutralizing antibodies is not an issue. Uh, or you could treat patients, let's say with prostate cancer where you have localized tumor or patients with bladder cancer where it's uh, currently the treatment regimen is local administration. So again, you could do the same thing. You could do the same thing with mesothelioma, for instance, where you could treat patients by intrapleural administration mm -hmm. of the drug, uh, and same with ovarian cancer. So you've got a number of different types of tumors where you can provide local or regional administration uh, where it would work, but not necessarily systemic because of the antibodies that would be generated if it was given by IV administration. Okay. Um, we have a bunch of questions uh, for her, and I just want to sure. give them to you rapid fire. Uh, please uh, contrast medicina offerings to lactoferrin with respect to Im immune response. Would lactoferrin or another compound be prescribed in conjunction with medicina drugs? Uh, well, the thing is, uh, lactoferrin obviously works in a different manner, but it certainly uh, boosts the immune system in such a way 
that, uh, yeah, you could potentially see that as a application where to restore a patient's immune system, you could potentially uh, use that as an approach. Uh, but we don't have any data and therefore I do not want to make any comments on if lectrophrine is the right candidate to combine with, uh, with MDNA-11. Great, thank you for that. Um, this might be one for Liz. Um, who are major institutional investors? Uh, can you talk about their approximate cost basis? Uh, as well as the strike price of warrants and options, and at what price did you IPO at? Uh, yeah, sure. So our largest um, shareholder would be the founders. So Fahar and his family have controlled about just under 30% of the stock. Um, in addition to them, there our next biggest holder is a fund called AIGH, which is a U.S. institutional fund. Um, I, I don't actually know their cost base as a lot of the stock's been purchased on the open market. Um, so yeah, hard to say. I would say it's definitely higher than where we're currently trading. That's, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Uh, and then behind them is Verition, which is another uh, US institution. Uh, and then there is a, a number of smaller um, worth ventures, ACT Capital, uh, there's a large um, European family office that, that can, has a couple of percent as well. The balance is fairly widely held Canadian and U.S. retail. Um, I know there's another part of that question. Oh, uh, warrants. So there are about 4 million warrants outstanding. There's three different tranches. So they range in price from $1.20 and those expire in December 2023. Uh, to 310. This is Canadian. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are out of the money right now, and those expire in March of, of this year. And then there's a third tranche uh, that's at $1.75 Canadian that expires in October of this year. So post data. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, just under 5 million stock options outstanding, and they have a weighted average exercise price of 217 Canadian. Great. Uh, and then uh, there was oh, another IPO. question the IPO, yeah. Yeah, so we um, actually did an IPO. We did a reverse takeover onto the Toronto Stock Exchange um, in March 2017, and that was at a price of $2 Canadian per share. Uh, we did a direct listing on NASDAQ because we were already um, publicly listed in Canada, and we were trading between 4 and $5 US at the time we did the listing onto NASDAQ. Great. Uh, this question is actually from Mark. I, I know you went over it a little bit, but can you explain um, your background and involvement with uh, Medicine? Uh, we follow them at Biopub, my, my website for several years, and have always viewed them as a choice, you know, prime investment. And uh, we think that stock is trading at really a mere fraction of the market cap it deserves to command. And uh, so I became associated with them that way, I began following them. I don't, Liz, I don't even know what year it was, 2018 to maybe. Uh, 2000, uh, yeah, I think we first met in early 2019. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. So we've been delighted with them, had them as guests on Biopub several times. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'll be again, again a guest in the March of this year too. Yeah. And uh, we work with Mark for a while and um, he vets a lot of um, companies for Tory Hills and very rarely has he been as excited about a company as he has about Medicina? Um, he can't say uh, you know, enough about uh, the company's potential and where he thinks they're going to be, and we, and we certainly agree with him. So I have three questions. The way I got to see today was Fahar Merchant on a roll. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it wasn't his coffee, I don't think either. So. <laughs> yep. Uh, we have three questions from one um, of our viewers. I think you answered the first one, which is how do neurosurgeons deliver the MDNA 55 drug locally on a wafer at open surgery or by stereotactic injection? Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's a stereotactic injection. The technique is very similar uh, to what uh, neurosurgeons normally do in a brain tumor biopsy procedure. So it's uh, image guided uh, placement of a catheter instead of placement of a biopsy needle and then delivering the drug that way. So no, it's not using a wafer and it's not open surgery. Okay. okay? So it's a minimally invasive technique. Great. Um, is MDNA 
55, a combination of drug and device or drug only by the FDA. There are now FDA approved Gilead wafers in use that could serve it as a similar product for comparison. Right, so Gliadel, which is the wafer approach is uh, really a drug device combination because there's a, a wafer that's uh, coated or saturated with the drug. In our case, uh, the, the approval process would relate to the drug as based on our discussions with the FDA, that it would be a uh, drug approval. And because the catheter is, has already got a 510K, uh, the, the catheter would need to be relabeled so that it can be used or the label would state that the catheter can now be used and approved for delivering MD-955. So from that perspective, there'll be a separate uh, change basically to the labeling requirements on the catheter, uh, whereas the drug itself would be the one that would be approved and we'd expect that the two would uh, occur in a sort of a, a simultaneous or concurrently. Okay. And for her, correct me if I'm wrong, but um... Gliadel is not a direct competitor to 55 because those patients have to be surgically resectable, Correct. right? Which Correct. And we, don't, we don't need patients to have their tumor yeah. to be accessible for surgery. Correct. Correct. So that's true. I mean, that's a big difference between uh, MDNA 55 and Gliadel. And uh, this is where Gliadel comes into play in only those patients where the, surgic, the tumor can be surgically debulked. And when patients are in a recurrent setting, when the tumor is relapsed, we find that generally uh, three out of four patients at relapse are not good candidates for repeat surgery. So they cannot receive uh, gliadel. Uh, this is where our focus is in those patients that cannot be surgically resected, which is the majority of patients with recurrent glioblastoma. So gliadel uh, is uh, placed following open surgery because you need to remove the tumor and then place this uh, gliadel wafer. And uh, clearly we've not seen substantial improvement in survival. In fact, the usage of gliadel is quite limited at the moment, uh, mainly because of the fact that uh, it can only treat patients that can be debulked. And that's not an easy task in recurrent GBM patients. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I believe um, this, um, viewer of ours uh, is a retired neurosurgeon, and um, he is saying, he, this is more of a statement than a question, but maybe you could talk a little bit about it. For multiple doses, you could install an Omaya reservoir with the catheter end in the tumor bed and allow multiple injections into the subcutaneous reservoir. Good, good question. And I think the Omaya reservoir is something that uh, we've thought about, uh, potentially that could be used for multiple um, administration. The challenge though with the Omaya Reservoir is that, uh, you know, most of the delivery is occurring by virtue of gravity, uh, where convection enhanced delivery allows us to sort of push the drug through a very tight uh, brain tumor structure so that we can get maximum coverage as possible. Now we have thought about the Omaya Reservoir, mostly for treating say, uh, tumors that have spread into the ventricles. So leptomeningeal tumors, for instance, where you need to administer the drug directly into the ventricles, uh, you could clearly use something like an Omaya reservoir where the drug is delivered right there. So uh, unfortunately, the Omaya reservoir doesn't do a, a good job in terms of uh, uh, covering. The, the, our focus is to not only cover the tumor, but also the two centimeter margin around the tumor as well. So, which is something we can accomplish uh, very easily with uh, uh, convection enhanced delivery, but not as effectively with the Meyer Reservoir. Okay. Got it. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, one other question, because we're, we're right at that hour. Um, yeah. Can you talk about like what type of arrangements you would have with a partner for MDA, MDNA 55? How would you structure that? Well, it'd be dependent on different uh, partners, but the, the focus would be really that uh, it would be comprise of them conducting uh, the registration trial in their territory uh, in return for upfront payment, in return for milestone payments, uh, as well as royalties from sales that would occur. They would be responsible for the clinical trials, they'd be responsible for the registration in their countries, They'll be responsible for marketing, sales, launch of the drug, et cetera. Uh, so that would be typically what would be 
uh, you know, key points in the any kind of, kind of partnership agreement. Okay. I think we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much for Har, <laughs> Elizabeth, Mark for coming on today and and uh, having this discussion about medicine. There's so many exciting things happening with the company. We look forward to that data coming out in the summer. Um, <clears throat> I would tell everyone we're not an investment bank and uh, we, you know, we, we don't make recommendations, but certainly uh, Medicena, in our opinion, is way, way, way undervalued based on what they have. Great time to invest uh, right now. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, stock is pulled back. And I think for um, you know, the market that they're addressing, uh, the data, uh, I mean, you can't help but be impressed with what they presented today. Um, it's really worth taking a look at down here at a sub $100 million dollar a market value when you consider all the M&A uh, transactions that have happened uh, with, with companies that have, are at the same point as Medicena um, pretty much and B, you know, the, that, you know the, the drugs just aren't as good as what uh, Medicena has to offer. So uh, definitely worth taking a look here. So um, folks, watch this tape when it gets to YouTube because seriously, rewatch for Harsh presentation. Biotech doesn't get any better than that. Yeah, for okay. sure. And and I recorded this and I'll get the YouTube link to everyone. Uh, definitely take another look at it. So um, thank you again for coming on. So Happy in the man. meantime, yeah, thanks. And in the meantime, you can get additional information on Medicina Therapeutics at the company's website, medicina.com, including details on the company's current research and press releases. Definitely worth going there to take a look. So again, I want to thank all of our attendees um, for your time today. I look forward to your feedback. I'll be sending the feedback link at the conclusion of uh, the webcast. Thanks for all your great questions today. Uh, your timely feedback is definitely uh, appreciated. So uh, we're going to wrap it up here. And until next time, everybody, uh, be safe and be well, and we will talk to you soon. Thank, thank you. you for thank you. Okay.